So when I was a kid, maybe six or seven, we all took a family trip to a beach in Florida. We were staying in a beach house that was sort of walking distance from the beach. We went to the beach and I was supposed to stay inside of my mom, but I wandered way too far down. And before I knew it, I was lost. A lot of the houses looked the same and I wasn't sure which one was ours. Plus, I couldn't see my mom anywhere. It then started to rain. I eventually came to a path that I was pretty sure led back to our house. Only, it didn't. It led to a house, but all of it was parking lots. There was a big dirty van parked there. It was the only vehicle around. I was about to turn back, when I noticed an overweight woman with brown hair and a hot pink tank top, with those big clunky glasses that were popular in the 80s waving around and smiling at me from the passenger seat of the van. She then said something like, Oh my, it's raining. Where's your mommy? Let us take you to her. You know, it's dangerous to be out here in the rain at this time. You could get struck by lightning. She was very friendly, almost overly so. In the driver's seat was an overweight man with a shirt on, a hairy gray chest and some clunky looking chain. He was wearing yellow tinted elvish shades and staring at me intently. He was also smoking a cigarette, which I knew was bad for you. The woman then stepped out of the vehicle and knelt down to me. She asked me how old I was. When I told her, she gleefully remarked, Oh my, we have two boys your age at our house. You should come over and spend the night. We've got movies, Nintendo, and in the morning, we've got all types of cereal. I had been taught all about stranger danger before, but at this point in my life, no adult had ever given me any reason not to trust them. The lady then continued on talking about stuff like how the boys have to go go-karting and how they like to drink chocolate milk. She made it seem very enticing for a seven-year-old at this point, and I trusted her. I mostly liked the idea of getting to play with some other kids my age. Then I remembered I needed to ask my mom first. I told her this, and she told me it was no problem because they just live up the road. My mom shouldn't mind. It then started raining harder and harder. She eventually opened the sliding door of the van and said something like, Now let's get you out of that rain and go find your mommy. I knew logically I shouldn't, but the lady seemed so nice and I desperately wanted to get out of the rain. As I walked toward the door, I noticed an awful stench that almost made me gag. This set off alarm bells in my head. Something wasn't right. There were cigarette butts all over the floor. I then looked up at the man. He was not only fat, but he was staring at me with a menacing glare. He had a real creepy, toothy smile and his teeth were stained a yellow dark. I couldn't pick up on everything that was so messed up, but there was a weird vibe from him. I knew now that I should run, but the woman was ushering me to hurry up and get in. Her demeanor had changed. She was being demanding and literally trying to push me into the van. She sounded angry and said get in already, in a tone that was complete opposite of how she sounded before. I jumped to the side and started running as fast as I could. The woman managed to grab my arm or my wrist, but somehow was able to quickly break free and run to the beach. I think she tried to chase me, but like I said, she was severely overweight. I finally made it back to my mom, who was absolutely freaking out. I tried to explain everything that happened to me, but I don't think a seven-year-old could even convey the type of gravity or weight of the situation, and I was never able to fully explain to her what happened. I'm extremely lucky that I managed to escape, because who knows, who knows what would have happened. Every year for summer holidays, my family and I go to my grandparents' house in a region in France called Britannia. They were lucky enough to live on a cliff right next to the beach, which is pretty neat. For you to understand the situation I was in, I'll do a quick description of the place, and most importantly, how to access the beach. When we get out of the house, we need to cross a little road to get to an entrance between bushes. Then, it's a clear but narrow path that you can take, just to enjoy a view of the sea or you can also go to the staircase built on the rock on the cliff. Then, you just have to walk on medium-sized stones, and ta-da, you finally arrive at the beach. The place itself isn't pretty big, but there's only a few ways to access it, by the staircase I described, or by another one at the other end of it. Also, a big thing to mention is as I grew older, I stopped building sandcastles and swimming with my family. I'm 18 now, and the older of three siblings that are way younger than me. So I was done playing child's games. I had started to climb cliffs for fun, not steep ones. It was more of those semi-hiking of partially collapsing cliffs. This will be relevant later on. Now onto the story. 
Last year after having dinner, I headed out for a little walk on the beach. No one else seemed determined to come with me, so I went alone. No big deal. I did this every evening. After going down the staircase, I walked a little bit. And then I sat down on a stone to smoke a joint and listen to some music. Not really smart, but hey, I'm a teen in the little village I go to every summer. And as much as I love my family, it gets pretty boring from time to time. Anyway, I'm enjoying my time when I spot this guy out of the corner of my eye. He's maybe 40 meters away from me. No big deal, I thought. It's a free access beach after all. But then, he starts heading in my direction, towards me. His head was shaved completely bald, and he had square-shaped glasses on. He was around his mid-twenties or early thirties, I thought. He was pretty tan, like he worked outside for a long time. The bald dude is getting closer, but again, I don't own the beach. As he's coming next to me, I hear over the music that he's trying to talk to me. I then remove my headphones and he says something along the lines of, Hey, you look very familiar. Have we met before? I answered with a calm but firm no, but he kept on insisting that he saw me earlier at the beach today. I said, sure, maybe you did, but there are tons of people at the beach. I don't remember everyone I see. The way I'm responding clearly implies I'm not interested in having a conversation with him, but he then sits on the stone next to me and keeps on talking, mostly about himself. He loves beaches, the weather is nice, but I'm nice with him. That's when he got creepy. He said it's very rare to find girls this nice and that he's happy I'm not angry. He then asked about my name, where I live, and of course, I didn't say a thing. He then starts to lean in closer, which made me feel really uncomfortable. He had a huge grin on his face. That's when it hit me. Remember when I said there was only two entrances to the beach? This guy was sitting right between me and the staircase. I was completely cornered. No one was there. We were completely alone. And even though I'm quite athletic, I'm only four feet nine inches tall and weigh 90 pounds, but this guy is twice my size and he clearly wants to continue our discussion. As I'm not responding, he starts to sound very annoyed, clenching his fists, but still with a stupid grin glued to his face. He then asked me if I'm a really good girl and why I won't talk to him. I'm absolutely afraid at this point. I then looked to my left and almost let out a sigh of relief. To my left is a cliff that I'm used to climbing it's right next to us, and even though they are more like hiking than climbing, I could rush to the top in a matter of seconds, as I'm used to doing it. I can run down the narrow path and get home safe. So I just got up and said, I don't want to talk to you anymore. Good evening. He looked startled for a moment, looking back at the staircase for a second, which confirmed my suspicions. He thought he had blocked up my only way of escaping, since the other stairs were way too far. To this day, it still scares me to think about his first reaction. At this point, I'm high, tired, and terrified. But I start to walk confidently to the cliff at a high pace. In the corner of my eye, I can see that he is now standing, looking in my direction. As soon as I'm close enough, I literally start to jump for the rock. I jump from rock to rock as fast as I can, scratching myself in the process. When I arrive at the top, I look down, and he's looking at me, not spoken like before, but frowning looking like he's on the verge of committing a crime. He then started sprinting towards stairs. I then sprinted to my grandparents' house, which luckily was damn close, and I explained everything to my mother the next day. I reported the guy to the police station, giving the best description that I could. Since it's a small village, they could have apprehended him easily if he was a resident. But to be fair, the police here sucks, so nothing came of it. But yeah, that's my story. I'm so grateful the guy never caught me. But to this day, I always think back on that reflection. I always wonder, what would have happened if he did? But this happened about seven years ago. I was staying at my friend Diana's house, and she lives pretty close to a small beach, which is really more of a vague shoreline, but it's still nice. We both enjoyed going out on adventures at night. So one night we decided to go for a walk and ended up walking along the shore. Her dog Penny was with us and occasionally would run out to the water doing cute dog things. I'm not a huge dog person, so I'm not sure what type of dog she was, but she was about medium sized. Not too big, but not too small. Definitely too big to be called small though. We were only there for about 10 minutes before we heard a twig snap behind us from the forest at the edge of the shore. Both of us froze, listening to see if we could hear anything. We thought we heard someone shushing someone else behind a bush. We brushed it off and thought we were being paranoid. 
but we remained on high alert anyway. The tide was coming in, and there was only one way back to safety, a single path, which we had just come down earlier. Everywhere else was essentially a cliff, covered in thorns and whatnot. Not fun to climb. We then started making our way back on the path, taking our shoes off since we realized we waited too long, and wouldn't make it back before the water reached us. As we were walking, we heard more twigs snapping in the forest and hushed voices. We then looked at each other and paused. Diana then asked me what we should do, and I really didn't know. Everyone was at her home and was asleep. We couldn't call them, and we didn't want to call the police either, because it wasn't a dangerous situation yet. I then ended up telling her we had no choice. We had to make it to the path before the tide came in. We then started again, picking up the pace a little, coaxing Penny along with us. It's at this very moment that we heard a growl and a low bark, followed quickly with more hushing sounds. I could hear the voices, although I don't remember exactly what they said. There was two men, and they had a dog with them. There were also no houses close to the shore. Diana's house is the closest one, and that's a good five minute walk away. The forest that surrounds the shore is pretty thick as well, and it's not good for camping at all. There is no viable reason for someone just to be out here hanging out this time of night as well. We both register this and start to run. I heard one of them yell, go get him, and I heard the dog's collar jingle as it started to run after us. Penny was right behind us, so when we saw the silhouette of a dog in front of us, we knew it wasn't her. The dog started growling aggressively at us, and Penny was bouncing around playfully behind us, clearly not sensing the dog's aggression. She was a pretty young dog though. We all stood still, unsure what to do. The sound of twigs breaking was getting closer and closer, and Diana carefully knelt down to a rock and tossed it towards the forest, to which the dog, Penny, went chasing after it. Diana was worried about Penny, but we kept on running. We hardly stopped for a breath, and we finally made it to the path, before the tide, I might add. We could see flashlight beams in the forest and heard the men clumsily maneuvering through the branches. We called for Penny as silently as we could, but she never came. We ended up having to leave her and go without her, as the men were getting too close. We then ran back to her house and locked the door. We haven't talked about what happened since. We all went to bed, and luckily, Penny somehow showed up the next morning, perfectly fine. In case anyone was wondering about her, I've had a few strange encounters since, but this was the only time I ever felt truly in danger. I'm so happy that Penny came back. I'm so happy that I'm still here to tell a story.